Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Lynn Sipolin, and I'm a member of the Public Education Committee of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Welcome to our webinar, Get Unstuck from Depression and Anxiety with Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, Principles for Your Daily Life. These webinars are presented by the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, which is a leading nonprofit organization in the field of anxiety and depression. Our mission is to improve diagnosis and promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of anxiety, depression, and stress-related disorders through education like this webinar, practice, and research. Please take advantage of the amazing resources on our website, adaa.org. You'll also find a great list of treatment providers. Just click on Find a Therapist from the homepage, as well as a, peer, a free peer-to-peer -peer online support group. If you have a question after watching the webinar, you can send an email to webinars at adaa.org. And you can support ADAA by making a charitable donation on the website. Okay, so let's get started and introduce our presenters. Diana Hill, psychologist, is a co-author of the ACT Daily Journal, Getting Unstuck and Living Fully with Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. She is also a co-host of the popular podcast, Psychologist Off the Clock, and offers regular teachings in compassion and act through Insight LA and Mindful Heart programs. Through her online teachings, executive coaching, clinical supervision, and private therapy practice, Diana encourages clients to build psychological flexibility so that they can leave more meaningful and fulfilling lives. Diana practiced what she preaches in her daily life as a mom of two, homesteader and yoga teacher. Learn more about her latest offerings here or follow her on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to get tools to build psychological flexibility into your daily life. Our other presenter is Katie Rothfelder, who holds a master's in counseling from St. Edwards University, is a registered behavior therapist and a licensed practice uh, practitioner. She has achieved a number, she has, uh, Start over. She has received a number of advanced trainings in applied behavior analysis, acceptance and commitment therapy, and cognitive behavior therapy. She holds her BA in communication studies, focusing on interpersonal factors in disclosing and relating to mental illness. She has worked for several years in the development and marketing of local nonprofits and provide advanced behavioral um, services to early learners with autism and other developmental disabilities. She provides upwards of 15 hours a week in volunteer service to numerous organizations, such as the International OCD Foundation, the Associ Association for Contextual Behavioral Sciences, and Psychologists Off the Clock, Off the Clock podcast. A new clinician, Katie is committed to specializing and supporting individuals suffering with OCD and related disorders, and provides evidence-based treatment in individual and intensive programs at Austin Anxiety and OCD Specialist in Austin, Texas. Okay, I'm gonna pass the slides to the presenters and welcome. Thank you so much, Lynn, for that introduction. Mm -hmm. And it's good to see you here, Katie and Sasha. And today we're gonna to be talking about acceptance and commitment therapy, how to get unstuck and live more fully from anxiety, depression, and depression with ACT. In today's talk, we're going to be exploring what is ACT and using a metaphor of climbing with psychological flexibility, we're going to be exploring these three core components that build your psychological flexibility, which are being open, aware, and engaged. And hopefully by the end of today, you'll have a few ideas around how to bring ACT into your daily life and an introduction to what this approach is and how it may be useful for depression and anxiety. I'm a psychologist and I like to see myself as a psychological flexibility guide. I aim to help people grow values rich lives, but I'm also a human. I'm a mom, friend, daughter, yogini. I love bees. And um, as, as was mentioned, I'm a podcaster. And I'm Katie, I'm a therapist, um, and I also just love hearing Diana talk about her humanness side. Um, I also use psychological flexibility kind of as my guide, really hope to show my clients um, the, that 
curiosity and compassion can can support you in, in making brave and, and bold moves. I'm also a, a daughter, a friend, a dog mom to a blue healer named Thor, um, a runner <laughs> and a new climber. And when clients come into therapy with me, oftentimes they sort of start by talking about their problems, right? All the problems that brought me here, all the things that I'm struggling with. But really one of the first questions that I like to ask folks is, what is it that you care about that brought you here? Because oftentimes underneath our struggles is something that we deeply care about. And I imagine if you're watching this webinar and you're here today spending the, your precious time uh, with us, there's something that you care about that brought you here. And I think it's important to take a pause and reflect on that. Maybe it's something that you care about in terms of your own mental health and a life that you wanna live or somebody else that you care about that you're here to support. And just to start with what I care about that brought me here, uh, Katie actually asked me to do this webinar with her. And I really care about Katie. I really care about her professional <laughs> relationship and supporting her as a therapist and all the support that she's given me as well in, in my career. I really care about disseminating and sharing these ideas about ACT. They've been personally really beneficial to me. And then I also see the dramatic changes that have happened with my clients. I care about sharing these ideas that often kind of are stuck in ivory towers with people uh, in their daily lives and also people that may not be able to have the resources for therapy uh, or regular counseling. So I care about sharing these eyes and these ideas in a, in a bigger way. How about you, Katie? What, what do you care about that brought you here? I care about, um, you know, I think one of the things that brought me to ADAA is um, getting to learn from, from other people. And so I, just as you all are probably watching this webinar to get information and, and kind of build your lives, I have used ADAA to get information and build my clinical practice in my life. And I've also just been so blessed and grateful to get to kind of watch some of my mentors like Diana um, who agreed to kind of do this with me, but also the other women on psychologists off the clock and my mentors in my clinical practice who have given me the, the dissemination and the research. And um, I see that and I want to embody that and show that in my own life. And so I, I do these kinds of things because they seem really valuable to me and also um, are a part of just how I want to give back to the community. So today we're going to be exploring ACT, and it's great to start with ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, with what we care about, because ACT is really about values. It's a values-driven approach uh, to therapy, and it's science-informed. So at this point, there's over 600 randomized controlled trials of ACT. The science has just been skyrocketing in the past number of years, and ACT has been shown beneficial for anxiety and depression and chronic pain but it's also beneficial for performance. It's beneficial for maintaining healthy habits and they're even using it in the workplace at this point because ACT is really about flourishing in your life and what does it take to flourish? ACT is an, is an acceptance-based approach to therapy. So a lot of times when we go into therapy, we're thinking about all the changes that we wanna make or mm -hmm. how we wanna feel better or different. And ACT is really about, uh, is, is a, a newer sort of third wave approach that incorporates a lot of acceptance in combination with taking action and the behavioral psychology, the behavioral science around how do we maintain a, a behavior change and uh, make the changes that we wanna make in our life. Ultimately, the goal of ACT is to become what's called psychologically flexible. And we're going to be talking today about what psychological flexibility means. But when you sort of look at psychological flexibility, it's your ability to open up and allow whatever is happening in your inner experience while still staying committed and oriented towards what you care most about. And I don't know if there's any questions around what ACT is, Lynn, that you want to ask. Well, I think that a lot of uh, clients um, have heard about cognitive behavior therapy or dialectical behavior therapy, all those BTs and CBT and DBT. And I'm wondering um, if, if you can comment a little bit about how it's similar or different um, from that. 
Yeah. So ACT is another acronym. Psych- psychologists love acronyms, but um, <laughs> ACT, is, ACT is similar and different. It's both, right? So it's considered a cognitive behavioral therapy. It's considered sort of a modern cognitive behavioral therapy where traditional cognitive behavioral therapies may be focused on changing thoughts. Mm-hmm. Uh, ACT is not about changing thoughts as much as it is about being able to step back from them, observe them. Mm-hmm. It's considered a third wave uh, therapy, which is more incorporates more of these acceptance and mindfulness practices, very similar to what DBT does, dialectical behavior therapy. But I would say it's a little bit less structured than DBT. Uh, it, it, there isn't a specific um, uh, order that you follow in ACT or specific modules, but rather it has a little bit more flexibility in the pro in its approach, uh, and it's a little bit less skills based than than DBT. It's much more what's called process based. What are mm-hmm. the processes that we can engage in that um, help us be a little more flexible and values aligned in our lives? Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Okay, so from this point you might have noticed and and kind of diana alluded to this as well is that throughout this this slide will or this presentation really will be using this metaphor of climbing and we chose that for a couple of different reasons um one is kind of a, a personal note i recently started climbing or bouldering and this has kind of brought out a lot of different thoughts for me and different experiences that I've been able to kind of integrate into um, helping me to be psychologically flexible. And so we're hoping to kind of integrate those as a part of the presentation, but also seeing that, you know, the the journey of kind of climbing up a mountain is kind of almost cliche, very much uh, what the process of going through your life is. Um, You know, every morning you get up and you kind of chalk up. So you you put on all of the things that you need for the day. Um, And even though you have kind of an understanding or a knowing of, of what the day may face, we're always kind of in this feeling like a beginner. So our minds are really good at making us feel like we don't know or that we're not enough, um, wanting to get certainty in the moment. Um, And so isn't kind of uncertainty and anxiety like that, like going up in the climb and not really knowing how we're going to do or um, that that feeling of falling or failing like depression and so we're going to be kind of using this this idea of climbing up a mountain as as we talk today so really kind of expanding on what i was just saying is that like our our minds naturally give us a hard time when we're doing hard things And so really part of the pieces of being psychologically flexible and a part of acceptance and commitment therapy are the, this open, aware and engaged space. So we start from a place of, of noticing, um, of noticing the idea that our mind gives us this hard time. And so you might think when we're, when we're not psychologically flexible, when we're not noticing how our thoughts, our mind, our, our experiences, so our thoughts, feelings, our behaviors are um, impacting our ability to live in the present moment, you might notice like, am I stuck in one spot? Mm-hmm. Um, so is, am I not moving based on what I care about? Am I afraid to look around? So not being in this place of curiosity, but instead really fused with our experience. Are you worried that you might fail? Um, Afraid to take that next step or do that next thing because what if I fall? Um, Wondering if you're strong enough. So getting absorbed in the content, telling yourself all the reasons with your thoughts that it's not gonna work out. Um, Not knowing where to take your next move. Um, We'll talk about values and allowing those to orient our lives. And when we 
or questioning or doubting our next moves, we can get so stuck in one spot. So we're going to kind of talk about how we can, can move out of this stuck place of being stuck on the rock um, and start to live psychologically flexible. So first, um, you know, we start from a place of, of remembering that you are whole, that you are a whole human being with these thoughts, feelings, behaviors, experiences. Um, and from that place, from that source of, of what we would call compassion, of recognizing that you're a human being with struggles, this, this allows us to move a little bit more freely. Um, and I actually, I might even kind of invite us to do um, a little bit of an exercise, almost thinking about um, something. So if we think about our minds kind of on autopilot right now, um, so we're engaged in an activity. And so what maybe are the rules, the things that your mind makes up about how you should be acting in this moment? So while you're watching this presentation, is your mind sort of generating like what you should be getting out of the presentation, how you're supposed to act when you're watching a presentation? Um, maybe you're fused with your experience of thinking about how learning about these processes isn't going to help um, and noticing your autopilot for this on purpose. So maybe think about the thoughts, feelings, sensations for just a moment on purpose. And then as we do this, and as you start to notice what it is that your mind sort of makes up about this experience, maybe we can take this with us into the rest of the presentation of, of how we want to respond as our mind kind of shows up. And then from this place, we'll move to um, kind of our next steps of what do we do once we recognize that we are whole. Yeah, so what do we do after we recognize that we are whole is that we acknowledge from this noticing place, we remember that at the end of the day, wherever you are on the rock that you're climbing, you're on a rock. That literally, we are all existing on a rock together, this, this rock called earth. Um, and at the end of the day, the day will end and we'll take off our shoes and we'll put away our chalk and we'll go to bed and we'll start again. And so this, this place of acknowledging that we are holding our struggles in this sort of process of life. Oh, Diana, you're muted. And ultimately, it's about how do you want to climb the mountain of your life? So a lot of times we can get into this belief of like, when my anxiety goes away, then I'll start feeling better. When I have a life partner, I'll still start feeling better. When this pandemic is over, then I'll start feeling better, right? And the, the, the nature of life is that it's actually right here and right now, how you climb, how you act in the here and now that helps build a rich and meaningful life rather than some end point that we're trying to get to. And that's what's really different about, I think, ACT and sort of these third wave approaches is being present in the life that you have right now and what can you do on your climb as it is in the situation that you're in. Because one of the guarantees is that life is uncomfortable. Uh, we are all going to experience loss at some point. We all experience physical pain in our life. And we all experience uncertainty, change. And all these things are very uncomfortable. It's the guarantee of, sort of, of being human. We can't get rid of the fact that life is uncomfortable. And in fact, struggling with our discomfort is often what makes it worse. So if you think about something like anxiety, social anxiety, 
it's uncomfortable to go into a social situation, right? Or to be exposed in that way. But when we shut down to the discomfort of living, when we turn away and we avoid or um, don't go, our life can get more and more narrow, right? Something like depression. Depression can be extremely uncomfortable. And our human tendency is to avoid what's uncomfortable, physical pain or emotional pain. And when we avoid that discomfort, either by getting back in bed or not going out into the world, we can see how our, we don't start to live in ways that are aligned with maybe how we want to be or build the life that we want to have. So struggling with our discomfort makes it worse. Trying to not think certain thoughts or feel certain feelings can actually make them worse. And there's a lot of research on this right now. So for example, if you try and not think about the fact that you are breathing, whatever you do, don't pay attention to your breath. And whatever you do right now, do not try and control your breath. Just let your breath be, don't control it. <laughs> you start to notice that, oh no, all I'm doing is paying attention to my breath, right? Because that's what happens when we actually try to suppress a thought or control or feeling. The paradox of control is that it can come back stronger. And we could map that on to experiences like a panic attack, right? The more you don't think about your heart beating, the more you don't think about your breathing, the more likely actually, or the more you try and control it, the more likely you are to experience pa panic. So with ACT, we're actually trying to help you open up and allow for the discomfort of life so that you can live a meaningful life. And what's interesting is that you're even more likely to experience discomfort when you engage in activities that matter to you. If you're a parent or a pet owner or a partner or a friend, you know this. All of those domains that may really matter to you are probably domains where you have some discomfort or where your greatest pain lies. So being able to engage in activities that matter to you also means that you're likely to experience discomfort in your life. And with ACT, we teach you how to be more psychologically flexible in the face of that discomfort. So to understand psychological flexibility, it's helpful to understand first what it means to be psychologically inflexible. And I like to tell clients that part of the reason why I went into this work is because I'm one of the most psychologically inflexible people that I know. So I need to practice it for like decades to be able to get even like an, you know, but it's a practice. So how do we know if we're being inflexible? We're closed down. We're rejecting our current experience. We're, we're, we're not, we're trying to suppress our feelings and our thoughts. We're what's called fused. And Katie used that word a couple of times. Being fused means that you're so bogged down. You're so close up to that rock that you can't see clearly. Or you're fighting with your thoughts and emotions so much that you can't see what else is happening around you because you're just entangled in the fight. Sometimes with clients, I'll say like, imagine, all your most anxious thoughts or your most depressed thoughts are on your hand. And then if you hold your hand right up to your face, Katie, you can do this and Lynn, you can do this too. Imagine that that's how close up your thoughts and feelings are. You can't see the screen and can't see the world very well. So that's fusion. And then we can slowly move our hand away to practice diffusion. Psychological flexibility is also when you get stuck, when you turn away from what, what matters. And what Debbie Sorensen and I write about in our book is this idea of being on a roundabout where you just keep on turning left over and over again and you find yourself going around and around in a stuck place. But when you're psychologically flexible, you're, you're open, you accept and allow your full experience to be as it is without fighting about with it. You're aware, you're present, as Katie described in that experience, you're sort of aware of what's happening with your, with your mind and your thoughts, but you're not totally entangled in them. And you're engaged. You're taking steps towards what you deeply care about. We're going to be breaking each one of these down a little bit more uh, to help sort of unpack what psychological flexibility could look like for you. So let's start with the, the open. Um, which is being fully aware and embracing with a kind of a willingness stance to, to all of our experience. And I was reminded as we were making this presentation of when I first started climbing, um, it was very values, values aligned. I wanted to try something new. I'm um, an old college athlete and um, was really kind of getting bogged down with finding myself in a rut of a routine and wanting to kind of be a beginner again and try something new. And 
inevitably, when I took a class just to sort of learn a few techniques, I noticed my mind um, giving me and generating lots of thoughts. So I'm not any good at this. People are staring at me. What if I fall and hurt myself? Um, I'll never be strong enough to actually do this. Look at all these other people that are shocking. I mean, the, the list just goes, those goes on and on. Um, and as I started climbing, I, I recognized that I was really fused with my experience. I was so focused on my thoughts and how people were um, thinking about me or how I was doing and was I strong enough to reach up to that next climb um, that I wasn't, I wasn't noticing this process of being a beginner and trying something new. And one of the instructors kind of, I, I came down from the climb and, and she was like, you know what? It's really interesting. You fall climbing up. And I kind of looked at her and I was like, yeah, I fall all the time. I, did you see that? I fell over. <laughs> and she said, no, you know, some people get stuck and they'll pause and then they just jump down or they come down. You fall leaping to the next rock. And it really struck me as she was pointing out something that I really care about, um, is that even when it's hard, I want to take that next step. I want to keep moving. And that place of willingness, so being able to see our whole experience and to choose what matters for us, knowing that it's going to be challenging, noticing that our mind is going to generate lots of thoughts, and choosing to, to show up anyway is, is part of being psychologically flexible. And so I kind of want to ask for us to take a minute, a moment to pause and imagine yourself with um, a struggle. Maybe it's even just something, something small. Um, so a part of your day that you're really not looking forward to, um, or maybe uh, something with anxiety. So something that you're afraid of to face, or you kind of white knuckle through your experience. So I'll do it, but it's just because I have to, and I, I don't really want to. Um, with depression, it, it might be the, the idea of kind of walking through life and not really feeling or only feeling one thing. So what it is, like, what's your climb today? Or what's the climb that you're about to face? And I want us to kind of practice literally looking at our experience and chalking up. So even using this sort of physical embodiment of like, here I go, I'm putting the chalk on my hands. And can you say yes, as you start to climb up your mountain? And as we start kind of climbing up our mountain, we, we're gonna recognize a couple of things. Um, it's easy when, I, you know, I face this with, in my own life with my own anxiety and also with my clients of, when we start facing the hard thing, our brains are really good on focusing that it's a hard thing and getting kind of in this sort of white knuckling experience of I have to do this and I'm going to do it and and getting really bogged down by the the thoughts um, and the experience of it being hard. Um, I told the story to Diana uh, a few days ago about uh, a teenage client that I'm working with who has a really big fear of getting sick. And so we've been practicing willingness of um, exposing ourselves to the idea that we might get sick and being able to tolerate that so that we can live a really meaningful life. And so we did kind of this funny experiment where we took bamboozled beans. So from Harry Potter, there's these, these bird spots, every flavored beans. And in this container, one is a really kind of sweet tasting. And then an identical matching one is like a really nasty, like dog food or throw up or uh, like toothpaste. So these really like 
no one wants to put this stuff in their mouth. And um, we, we did this activity together and I noticed her thoughts getting really swept up in the, what if I get something that's really terrible and I don't know if I can handle it if I do and what if I get sick? And we did it together we noticed that each of us had these identical ones and one of us was going to get uh, the nasty flavor. And I told her, I was like, I'm willing to get the nasty flavor because I care about you and I care about us showing up for it together. So I was willing for it to taste bad. And she did it. She put it in her mouth and then she burst out laughing. And she said, oh, it's pear. Um, and, I, and I got the nasty one. <laughs> And that, and that was okay. Um, so as we show up to the hard thing, it can be both. So we can look at our hard experience from a playful perspective. When we're climbing, you are equally pushing against the rock as you pull inward towards something, towards your experience to kind of pull you up. Um, similar to where we might be really pulling in the things that matters as we push ourselves forward. Um, you can grip with strength to so move towards the things that you care about and also move lightly. Um, take leaps, but not in a sense of just recklessness, but a what is important to me and what matters. Um, being mindful as you look around. These are all kind of these dual pieces that we take as we as we go from this kind of open and aware stance. And aware. So similar to Diana did with her with breathing, um, maybe we can take a moment right now to notice um, where's your left foot? And do you feel kind of the toes inside your shoes or if you're barefoot, maybe you feel um, like the sole of your foot on the ground. And noticing too, were you thinking about your left foot before? Um, and and our, our minds are very much like this, um, that we can get stuck in one spot or stuck on one thought. Um, and forget that there are other parts of our experience. So if we are anxious about the idea that we might get sick, our thoughts might be fused as we kind of talked about before that, um, and that's, that's what's absorbing us. And can we take a step back and say, this is one part, um, but what, what is another part? What else can I show up to? So I might invite you right now, or I will invite you right now um, to pick something in your life where you feel a little bit stuck. So you would choose this one as if you were gripped on the rock and you, you're not sure of where to take your next hold or your next move. Um, and pick uh, this, this place of feeling stuck and notice what your mind tells you about the stuckness. Ask yourself, like, what am I gripping to really tightly right now? What thoughts, sensations, feelings? With depression, it might be something like, I can't handle this anymore. I can't do this. And notice what sensations show up when you are really focusing on that thought from that stuck space. And when we acknowledge that this is where we're stuck, it's kind of like in order to get away from the stuckness, we have to notice that that stuckness is just one part of our experience. So similar to how you might have 20 different options of where you can grip on a rock. It's like 30 different thoughts that swim into your mind in a matter of two or three seconds and your brain latches onto one. So can you move and let go of that one thought so that you can keep climbing? And all the while, while you're climbing, noticing that there were a mirage of thoughts and places that you could hold or grab onto. 
and that naturally you're going to grab onto one and then you'll let it go and you'll reach for a different one. And this is kind of the process of our minds. So if the first two aspects of psychological flexibility are about being open, so opening up, being willing to have our full experience as it is, being aware of what's happening in our mind, what's happening in our body, what's happening in the present moment. The third aspect of psychological flexibility is how are you going to engage with your life? And being engaged really has to do with knowing your values, where you want to go, and taking action, taking the next step. So I'm going to break down engagement for you. And the research on meaningful engagement is, is wonderful in that folks that feel a sense of purpose and meaning in their life have a deeper form of satisfaction. It's a different kind of satisfaction when you feel like you are engaging fully in a life in a way that matters to you. They have more positive moods. They report feeling more enriched. Uh, there's a concept called post-traumatic growth by Tedichi and Calhoun, which is the idea that we can come out of trauma, there, a lot of research has been done on post-traumatic stress, but we can also come out of trauma with an experience of being changed in a meaningful way, with deeper connections, with a greater sense of purpose and understanding of your personal strengths. And um, for some people, even spiritual growth as a result. Having meaning, being meaningfully engaged in your life also helps you get a sense of your part of something greater and bigger. And when we look at how do we engage meaningfully, it's, it's about really values and values and act um, has a little bit of a different spin than maybe some of the, the ideas that we have around values that we've heard in other areas. In act, values are really what it means to you to have a, a rich, fulfilling, full life. They're very normal. And really they're about actions. How do you wanna be as a friend, as a sibling, as a partner? Sometimes I'll ask clients if I, like follow you throughout your day with a video camera and follow you all day long and you were living out your value being a, a mindful parent or a forgiving co-worker what would I see you doing what would it look like on camera and those actions how we act in the world really are our values so Values are not necessarily about pleasure and a pleasurable life isn't a meaningful one. There's some research on, uh, for example, parenting. Parents aren't necessarily happier than non-parents and they even re report sometimes being less happy, but they report having a greater sense of meaning, right? So not everything that we engage in that's meaningful is pleasurable. And uh, values are very personal and chosen. So they're very much like favorite songs. If I were, if you were to think about what your favorite song is or your favorite band is, uh, you may sort of have memories that are associated with a time in your life, an experience you had, um, and feelings and, and uh, uh, a sense of um, sort of a deeper understanding of what that song means to you. And it would be very different than my favorite song or my favorite band, right? So your values are not any better than my values. They just may be different. They're personal and chosen and they're inherently rewarding, which means they come inside. They give you a sense of satisfaction when you're engaged in them. And they're really about qualities of action that you bring to the important domains of your life. Sometimes clients will say things like, I value my health or I value my family or I value my pets. But really values are, how do you want to be in relationship to your health? And for some people that may be, I want to go to the doctor on a regular basis and I'm not. For someone else, it may be, I want to be exercising on a regular basis, and I'm not. And when you can tap into what your values are, how you want to be in those important domains, then you start a path of what to do and how to live. One of the simplest ways to think about values is what gives your life meaning. And oftentimes we kind of think it has to be some big thing, like I need to write a book or, you know, have some grand scheme for my life. But often it's just these little sweet moments. When you think about your day, maybe you think about yesterday. What were the most meaningful parts of it? For me, it's often something related to my kids sitting down and reading a book with my child. It's probably one of the most meaningful parts of my day or being with a client and really being fully present with them while they're being vulnerable with, with me probably one of the most meaningful parts of my day. It's not these big, grand, giant schemes, but really the simple things in life. 
So you can bring this practice of values to your day by at the end of your day, oftentimes at the end of our day, we're thinking about all the worries we have for tomorrow. Or oftentimes we're thinking about all the things that we didn't get done. But at the end of the day, maybe taking a moment to pause and ask yourself, what was the most meaningful part of today? And letting yourself linger on that to start to get a clue into what's important to you, where your values are. And then it helps you kind of orient to doing more of that, engaging in life more in that way. And when you know you're going to ask your question at the end of the day, then maybe throughout your day, you start to make some choices to make that end of the day question line up in a way that you would hope. As I'm talking about values, you may notice that something is showing up for you, which is pain. Because a lot of times when we talk about values, it starts to expose areas of our life where we don't feel like we're aligned with our values, or maybe exposes the areas of our life that are um, both, both painful to us, but have some kind of meaning associated with them. Steve Hayes is one of the co-founders of ACT, and ACT was really co-founded by Steve Hayes, Kelly, Strassel, Kelly Wilson, Kirk Strassel. Um, and it's been developed over time and adapted over time by many, many researchers uh, and clinicians as well. And when Steve Hayes came on the podcast, I interviewed him a couple of times, he talked about values and pain. And he said, you hurt where you care and you care where you hurt. So sometimes where we hurt can actually be an arrow pointing to what we care most about. And that's where some of those skills that Katie was talking about in terms of being open and aware can be really helpful because sometimes we need to stay in the hurt to be able to get to the care. So you can think about that for yourself right now of what's uncomfortable in your life, what's painful, what's challenging for you. For some people, it may be a relationship, it may be a job that they're struggling with, it may be your own anxiety or depression that you're struggling with. And what does that tell you about what really matters to you? What does that tell you about what really matters, matters to you? Because you hurt where you care. And when you can start to uncover what you care about underneath the hurt, then you can use that caring to be where you dig in and drive your life. That's what can drive your next step, which we go back to this concept of engaged. I said engaged is about values and engaged is about action. So we uncover our values. What is it that I care about? And then we can start to take committed action towards our values. There's a really simple exercise and act that comes from Russ Harris and some other research called choice points. And the idea of choice points is that throughout our day, many, 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 many times, I'm going to leave this webinar, I'm going to go on to my next thing, see my next client, I'm going to come across a choice point. And the choice point is almost like a Y in the road, where if we turn one direction, we'll be moving towards the type of person that we want to be. We're acting in line with, oh my gosh, if someone took a video sh shot of me and played it for me again at the end of the day, I would feel proud of that moment. And then another direction is moving away from the life that we want to build. And sometimes moving towards the person we want to be is uncomfortable, right? Sometimes that choice point is also turning towards what's uncomfortable in that moment, like maybe having an uncomfortable conversation with somebody, right? Staying in an uncomfortable conversation a little longer, moving towards um, your things that make you feel anxious. So you come across that choice point many times in your day and you, and you practice the noticing of opening and awareness. This is a choice point. What would be the move that would move me towards the person that I wanna be in the life I wanna build? So pay attention for choice points. And oftentimes making that choice can feel like you're jumping off of a cliff. I worked with many years ago who had uh, panic attacks in Trader Joe's. And for, for, for me, in my experience, Trader Joe's is a happy place. Hawaiian shirts, happy people. They ask you about your day. I get my Chinese chicken salad. It's all good, right? For this client walking into Trader Joe's, felt like this picture. It felt like that to her. It was excruciating. And asking her to have a choice point of turning towards Trader Joe's was like asking her to, to fall off a cliff, right? Or climb that kind of a cliff. But what taking action towards your values 
actually looks like is more like the picture on the right. It's about making the next small move with support. And it's, you can make that small move as, as, as tiny as you want it to be. So for us with, with that client is let's just imagine walking into Trader Joe's. Now let's drive to the parking lot and call me from the parking lot. And then let's just walk to the door, right? So breaking it down into small, tiny moves that are in the direction of the life that you want to. And then why do you even want to go to Trader Joe's in the first place? Like, why would that be important to you, right? But the important thing to look at in this picture on the right is who is doing the climbing? Ultimately, it's you. It's you that makes the climb. And that's why having support and having a clear picture of where you wanna go and breaking it down to small pieces is so, so very important. So with committed action, we motivate our, our behavior based on what we care about. We get really clear on why am I doing this in the first place? And then we focus on the action, not the outcome. We focus on what we're doing, not where we go, but just what is the next step and can I take that next step, whether it's making it, taking a next step in terms of exposure or it's taking a next step in terms of behavioral activation of maybe increasing some pleasurable activities in your day if you're struggling with depression. Maybe the next step is getting out of bed and taking a shower and putting on clothes. During the pandemic, I had a number of folks that really struggled with things like brushing their teeth, um, taking care of your basic physical needs, changing out of clothes from the day and putting on a new pair of clothes. Some of those things can become really difficult for us when we, when we struggle with isolation or depression. And the next step, the next action step may be just doing a simple thing like brushing your teeth and living a towards lifestyle. So making those choices towards the life that we wanna build, making it small and getting support from places like ADAA. I love all of the resources that are available for you here in terms of support. And sometimes it's really hard to take in that compassion from others, but that can often be the key ingredient that we need to be able to live a values-rich life. And so as we're kind of wrapping up, um, all these different spaces that we've explored and um, with being open, being aware and engaged, we'll just go through them one more time. You know, psychologically, psychological flexibility is really best practice when it's practiced daily, when it's with even our smallest of choices. And so how we do that is that we start from um, being open. So accepting and allowing your full experience um, that whether we like it or not, the mountain is in front of us, here it is. Um, and we don't often get to choose our mountains. Um, and so choosing to say yes and showing up to our life from a place of willingness and then being aware. So being present, observing, stepping back from your thoughts and seeing your experience for all of its different crevices and, and moments, the good, the bad, the ugly, the meaningful, um, and then engaging. So taking a step towards what you deeply care about, even the smallest moves. And if you want to take a deeper dive into ACT, today was sort of an overview. There's a lot of resources out there available. So Act Daily Journal is a journal that I wrote with uh, Debbie Sorensen, my good friend first and co-author second. And in that book, we break Act down into its six core processes and offer journal exercises and simple practices day by day uh, that you can build some of these skills into your daily life. A Liberated Mind is written by Stephen Hayes, and that's sort of like my, my ACT manual. It, it offers um, a, a lot of information about the different processes of ACT and how to apply them to not only depression, anxiety, but also things like sports performance and relationships and pro-social action in the world. On Psychologists Off the Clock, the, the podcast that I co-host with Debbie Sorensen and Yael Shambran and Jill Stoddard, uh, we have interviewed a number of experts in ACT and specifically some experts that have talked about ACT, has spoken about ACT for anxiety, ACT for OCD, things like that. So that would be a great place to explore Psychologists Off the Clock. And then contextualscience.org is a website where 
there is so much information on there. You could go down an act rabbit hole and not come out for days. So uh, you can check that out. A lot of resources for both clinicians and for the general public. And Diana and I, kind of, as we mentioned throughout this presentation, we, we really care about bringing this information to, to you all, and we want to stay connected with the community. And so we have a number of ways that you can stay connected with us. Diana has a beautiful newsletter that comes out quite frequently that you can check out on her website, um, drdianahill.com. And Diana also does a number of um, meditations and practices on her different social media channels and with other organizations. And so I, I really just highly recommend being a part of her community. Um, if you'd like any to ask any questions to me or check in, maybe you're in the, the Austin, Texas area, um, you can email hello at austinanxiety.com and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And then join our Instagram. So Dr. Diana Hill is De or Diana's Instagram and she has beautiful posts that are just messages of um, different tools on being psychologically flexible. And, and I am also the dissemination coordinator for Off the Clock Psych, which is a fancy um, title to say that I do our social media. So <laughs> um, uh, you can kind of check us out there. Oh, you're Lynn. Muted, Lynn. Lynn, you're still Lynn, muted. You're muted. I wanted to thank you both for such a motivating and enlightening and helpful uh, talk. Um, the metaphors and the examples throughout really, I think, made it come alive. Um, one thing I was wondering is, I know you could not address this in full, but what about the uh, person who wakes up um, and feels like just um, they're feeling, I feel overwhelmed, or I feel like I just want to curl up and cry. And that's kind of where they're starting. How, how would you just begin to be speaking to the person about being open and aware um, and flexible um, when, they're, when they're struck by that um, uh, kind of general statement about wh what they're feeling at the moment? Do you want me to take it, Katie, or do you want to? Sure, you can go. Um, well, if we look at those three components of open, mm -hmm. aware, and engaged, mm -hmm. I would say the first thing is to open to the present moment, the sensations that you're that you're having and the thoughts, okay, I'm having the thought that I'm overwhelmed. What mm -hmm. does that feel like in my body? And can I also, there's an exercise that I often like to do with folks called one eye in and one eye out. So mm -hmm. can I have one eye in of what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking and noticing that what's happening in my body? Mm -hmm. And then can I also have one eye out? What's around my room? What do I see? Mm -hmm. what, do I, what do I notice so that we can start to get a little bit of flexibility from not being so consumed by what's happening inside, but mm -hmm. also be able to engage in what's outside. And then the next um, aspect of being uh, engaged is what is the next tiny step that I can do even with mm -hmm. this overwhelm? So it's almost like my overwhelm is in my backpack. And mm -hmm. then what is, what is the move I can make? And it may be my next step is getting out of bed and washing mm -hmm. my face. Mm -hmm. And then when we get there, we can bring one eye in and one eye out to that experience. And then what's the next step? Breaking it down to something small, being present. And really, ultimately, it's about kindness and compassion for yourself. This is a moment of suffering. And how can I just take the next best step? And a moment of feeling stuck, right? And, and, yeah. and not seeing anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, Thank that you. too, you know, you're the, you know, coming from a place of compassion, of sometimes we can get stuck in our values of thinking it has to be this outward action. And mm -hmm. we can even think about our values in those moments of how are my values applied to my inner experience? Like, mm -hmm. how do I want to show up for myself in the difficult moments? And maybe that's giving yourself some compassion or putting a hand and open palm on your heart and, and acknowledging like, here is this tough moment. Um, and, you know, I've kind of found like when we're in these really anxious places or these places where we're just feeling really down, even thinking and noticing how I want to be with myself before I take on the next mm -hmm. step from that kind of kind, compassionate place and very values aligned sort of like primes you to be able to, to do that next move of getting out of bed 
or getting off the floor and standing tall. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I don't think I had other questions. Again, thank you so much for your time and, and attention and, and, and a lovely presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Thank mm -hmm. you, Lynn. It's been a delight to be with you today. Take care.